Um, and so first, I wanted to thank you all for attending uh, this call um, and um, for our audience to learn more about conflict of interest policies. Um, but before we go into um, this session, um, I would love it for you all to introduce yourself. And uh, how about we start with Martha? Thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, my name is Martha Lackritz Peltier. I am an attorney uh, based in the US and I do focus on laws and regulations that apply primarily to nonprofit and tax exempt organizations, different kinds of civil society organizations. Globally, though, my legal background is really in sort of the US laws and regulations that apply to this entity type. Thank you, Martha um, and Lynette. Thank you, Tamara. My name is Lynette Micheni. I work for Terso and specifically the regional office in Nairobi, Kenya. I work with a bigger team on the STEP program and I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Lynette. Um, and Catherine, um, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, um, my name is Catherine Kiganjo. I work at Case Kenya Community Development Foundation, KCDF. I'm a team leader for organizational development and education at KCDF, where basically our focus is in, on community development, uh, really focusing on community-driven development as our uh, philosophy. Um, thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Um, and so let's begin um, with a very broad question. Uh, why is a conflict of interest policy important? And so We'll try and stay within the CSO lens. Um, and uh, Martha, we'd love to hear from um, the US perspective, um, why is a conflict of interest policy important for CSOs? Sure. So this is one of the sort of key tenets in the U.S. of what every nonprofit organization is expected to have. Um, the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service that regulates nonprofit organizations, does actually ask on an annual basis on the tax returns um, whether or not organizations have adopted a policy and whether or not on an annual basis organizations are required to actually circulate that policy and collect disclosures from their board members. Um, so from a legal perspective, it is considered quite seriously. Also at a state level, the state attorney generals who who govern nonprofits um, look very closely at conflicts of interest policies. Um, I will note that I would say that organizations beyond what is legally required also tend to take it very seriously within the sector and interpret it much more broadly than necessarily just what the law requires, which is an interesting um, real factor that plays out, uh, which is to say that in the U.S. it is often focused on material financial conflicts, whereas most nonprofit organizations in the U.S. are really looking at something broader, even though they might not be legally obligated to do so. Um, there is a lot of concern, um, you know, with potential relationships that might make an organization look bad because of political positions held by organizations or individuals that may be affiliated with them, for example, or um, gifts that may come from companies or individuals who could pose a potential conflict of interest. Um, so I, I would say that in practice, it's it's treated even more broadly than what the law requires, um, which is to say just that both on the legal level and in the very practical day-to-day -day best practices level, conflicts of interest policies are considered a really important way for organizations to understand and navigate um, not just the legal concerns that could arise from conflicts of interest, but also how that could affect their reputation and their the sort of public confidence in them. Thank you. Uh, and Lynette and Catherine, um, um, in your um, experience and uh, your perspective, uh, why is the conflict of interest policy important? Okay, maybe, maybe I will go first. And just to say that um, in, our, in our setup, um, conflict of interest has really become um, really more of trying to comply with a good practice. Um, it, it's not necessarily, it's not necessarily like, um, it, it's an area of, of, of development and, and especially becoming now necessary for compliance. And, and so many organizations will focus on really having a conflict of interest policy um, to just ensure they are really complying with good practice. 
Um, then uh, also it, it, it also has now become uh, more of developing a culture of an organization. Um, how, how, what do you do and, and how do you practice and how do you ensure that, that as you engage with whether at the organization level, uh, staff level, uh, at the board level, and also um, in, 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 in your operations and the people you deal with externally, it has become very key and important to have a um, conflict of interest policy, uh, especially in our, in our environment where corruption um, is, is, is really uh, almost acceptable or a way that people really do their business. So, so I, as I think for us, that's really the context at which um, conflict of interest really becomes an important issue and policy yeah. to develop. Yeah, thank you, Catherine. I really like that point of um, developing culture um, in an organization. Sometimes we tend to um, focus on requirements or checking boxes, um, but this is a really important point that you made about um, you know setting the precedent for your organization and um, developing that culture. Thank you. Uh, Lynette, uh, do you have anything else to add or um, should we move to the next question? Um, we can move to the next question, Tamara. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and so the next question is, what are key things to include in a conflict of interest policy? Um, and for this format, um, feel free to come off mute um, if you'd like to contribute or um, even share an example um, of your experience um, with your organization while developing a conflict of interest policy. Well, I can I can jump in and say, you know, I think this is the kind of thing where we need a lot of clarity as to how how we define what a conflict is. I have seen this play out before in organizations where there's an assumption that everybody has the same understanding of what a conflict is and when it needs to be disclosed, but there's so much ambiguity in there. Like I said, even just between what the law requires and what is considered best practices, there are differences there and, and people are coming at it from very different perspectives, particularly if you're looking at a board, say, um, there may be people who have only ever served on for-profit boards and so don't really know how to think about it in the context of nonprofit organizations or vice versa, um, you know, depending on people's own background or experience or how they interpret that terminology could really impact whether they disclose conflicts whether whether they would even consider them a conflict that requires disclosure. Um, so I think a lot of clarity in, in what the terminology means is really useful, um, including even examples, I think, um, is helpful for a conflict of interest policy. The other thing I'll note is Sometimes you have to address conflicts in different ways, depending on different circumstances. And, and, I'll, and I'll give a, a solid example of that. Um, so USAID, for example, the development, U.S. Development Agency, when they make grants to organizations anywhere in the world, they have very rigid conflict of interest requirements that go much beyond what, say, the U.S. nonprofit sector is just generally subject to. And so organizations may have to carve out certain processes for, for just for certain staff that are working on USAID funded uh, projects. And I, and, I, and I think that this would apply in a lot of different development agencies or maybe even donors who have certain requirements around um, when you're using our funds on certain projects, we don't want you doing this or investing in this or doing certain actions. So there's also often a need to carve out whether there are stricter requirements that may be necessary under different circumstances or programs within the organization. Thank you, Martha. Um, that was really helpful, especially providing that example. Lynette, Catherine, um, any examples um, that you've okay. had, um, that you've come across um, during your work? Okay, when you talk about um, what are the key things to include in a conflict of interest, um, like has just been said by Martha, um, that, well, the definition or even the purpose for which a conflict of interest is, is um, policy is developed. I think it's important to, uh, um, and that's why you talked about context um, as a CSO, the context mm -hmm. could be different from that of our, say, a corporate. So the, it's, it's, I think it's important that you, you contextualize and explain the purpose. And then uh, maybe um, other, other things that one would include in a conflict of interest would be defining what are the areas areas in which conflict may arise. Um, and that basically would be, for example, 
uh, say, uh, persons uh, and firms supplying goods and services. It could be competing. Uh, what are those competing issues or organizations that that you may you could be serving in that could create a conflict situation? Um, uh, or relationships that you may have. Uh, would it be, for example, family members or close friends? Um, it would be good that you are able to define those areas. Um, other things maybe you may look at would be uh, as an as a as a uh, if you were in a situation of conflict, how would you recognize that? Um, so, for example, if I'm a, I'm a sitting board member and there is an opportunity for a consultancy, for example. Um, how do I know that I, I, I that's conflict? So having just clarity on that, I think I think would be um, it, defining the so the nature of conflict as well. Uh, maybe another area that I could quickly talk about is um, uh, um, to whom to disclose. You know, disclosure. Um, would you disclose? And it's almost like reporting. Um, requirements. So if there was a conflict, who would you report? And then who would determine that it's a conflict? So it needs to be very clear who would then determine what is a conflict. Yeah, and maybe maybe that's probably a few that I would mention there. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks for that, Catherine. Yeah, and I from what we have observed is that because many nonprofits, especially in our context, most nonprofits are born out of a need to make a positive difference. So whether this, this is a family or a group of friends. And so because of the, the way in which most nonprofits begin, there is this sense of familiarity and we are family, we are friends and we trust each other. And so you find that in most cases, people will not necessarily invest in a conflict of interest. If anything, they'll just focus on the, the registration documents. So whether that's memorandum of articles or the constitution, but they, there is no intentionality in really understanding what could be apparent conflicts or future conflicts then as the organization begins to grow and they start to attract you know, new members who are not necessarily friends and family, then organizations are now forced to start thinking about these things. Also, sometimes when the donor um, community or they're targeting a certain financial support, um, then they would tend to invest in that. But in all these cases, we have seen that a key component in a conflict of interest or the foundation of a good conflict of interest policy would be a clear um, outlining of who does what and where. You know, because when board members and directors or even staff members, when there's no clarity of roles or where roles are very fluid, you find them it's very easy to find multiple cases of conflict of interest. But I, the context of how nonprofits begin really informs the extent to which organizations are aware of a conflict of interest or not. But yeah, a key thing to include or a foundational thing for a conflict of policy then is do your board members know their roles or they were just invited and told, hey, we are registering an organization. Could you be our board member? And they, they don't even know what that means legally or even morally. Yeah, but that, that would be my contribution to that. Thank you. Yeah, Lynette. yeah. Maybe maybe I could just add on that point that uh, Lynette has stated is that as, as part as of onboarding of board members, I mean that having that policy, conflict policy of interest policies is very important that. They also are aware that there's a there's there's that requirement, um, and and more so because um, as people join boards, they need to know that, I mean, they have to have the the choice to not accept their board, um, the responsibility of joining a board if they know they are going to lose if that that's not an option for them. Yeah. Yeah. 
I, maybe I'll add to that as well, because it's such an interesting point, because what I've noticed is in the U.S., really, the law treats conflicts of interest as only being an issue with respect to board members and executives, because they have the idea is they have the kind of authority to make decisions that could change the direction of the organization or make a payment or not make a payment. Um, so there's there's almost a gap in terms of in the U.S., people think less about, or, you know, day-to-day staff potentially having conflicts of interest that need to be addressed, which which I think is sometimes is missing in, in the U.S. sector. On the other hand, I don't see that as much outside of the U.S. I often see a focus actually on staff who are out engaging in the field and what are the conflicts that they may engage in that could lead to, you know, as Catherine mentioned, corruption or bribery. Um, this is the sort of day-to-day interactions that can exist even among someone who doesn't have sort of decision-making power within an organization. So I think it's always interesting to keep in mind both of those dynamics. And and I always recommend for organizations, if, it, if their conflict of interest policy only applies to the board, consider when it should apply to staff and vice versa. If a conflict of interest policy only applies to staff who are, you know, engaging in day-to-day programs, they should be adding some kind of requirement for directors as board members as well, um, you know, as Lynette and Catherine were pointing out, because because it's equally important and for very different reasons. It plays out in different ways, but I think that they both have an important role that everyone can be impacted by conflicts of interest. Thank you. Um, and... Let's move to the next question. Uh, How broad should conflicts of interest be interpreted? Do they only cover financial interests or are there other conflicts that could arise within a CSO that should be scrutinized? I actually already touched on this, and I'd love to hear from Catherine and Lynette, uh, just to repeat again, you know, in the U.S., the law really only looks at material financial interests, but I would say that the sector actually considers it to be much broader, which I think is is correct, if you will. I think it's more realistic. I think that conflicts exist beyond the perimeters of of money, um, mm-hmm. uh, which I see recognized much more um, in the laws, the definition of laws outside of the U.S. than within the U.S., although, as I said, I think the sector more broadly in the U.S. recognizes that and usually incorporates it into their policies. Okay, um, maybe uh, I would say that uh, it's not only on financial interests. Um, of course, that that usually is like the first issue that would arise. But then um, sometimes there's there's that borderline between conflict of interest and because what happens is that as a result of of, of the, there are ways in which you can compromise yourself or use your power that then results to you um, engaging in a conflict of interest. And for example, in our context, if you are to go and visit a, a, an organization that you are potential to fund, um, maybe you're going to do what you would call a organization assessment. Um, you, the typical thing is that when you arrive there, they may want to give you um, a gift, right? Um, and the gift could be, in our context, it could be in the form of, um, I'll put it in the most basic way, it could be um, uh, a, a, a chicken, Lynette, you probably will identify with this. And it's just maybe an, a, a token of appreciation, you know? And in our context, it is okay to be given um, a gift when you visit someone or, or live with what you'd call a basket, you know? But then we, you have to know to say no in, in a polite way, in a way that they understand you cannot accept that. Mm. Um, and it's, it's, it's so, such that even if you left and never, um, acno- or, never uh, or, or you did not accept or say that they cannot get the grant because they basically did not qualify, then you don't feel obligated to do that because you're left with that gift. Because those things tend to influence people's decision or create expectations. So I think that there's more than that because it could be in, depending on the situation you're in. Sometimes, uh, other than financial interests, uh, there, there could be a situation where um, conflict of interest then applies um, even when as a as a board member, you there's a, there are, there are issues that are on the table that are being discussed, and the, because you of the culture of the organization, people then declare before even the meeting starts. Uh, around people go around and there are 
requested to declare that there's no conflict of interest. It's not because of the financial interest, but because there could be issues that they could be of knowledge on, or they could be part of. Uh, um, and so that, that's why I think it's more than just financial interest. It depends on the context in which the issue is being raised. So Lucy, <clears throat> I remember once we had gone for an organizational capacity assessment and elders of this region were so touched by the kind of work we were proposing to partner with them. And they said, you know what, why don't you take this piece of land um, and you know do some projects? In Kenya, land is a big deal. Like, and this is in the Northern part of the country. And when they say land, it's large tracts of land. So yes, gifts are a big issue in our sector in terms of conflict of interest. I also see a situation around data or privileged, pri privileged information. So you might find that you're either in a board or working in an organization where you are accessing said data of a whole county. You know, like some of these education programs or health programs, they they have data around households, how many children, very in, um a lot of detailed data. And we have seen situations where such data has been used, for example, during the political time. So again, if you, you can imagine now that's already a conflict of interest because you have used organizational information and perhaps even sold it for a personal gain. The other thing would be also opportunities. Um, you can imagine in a situation where an organization offers scholarships, you know, to, to children. And I have a sibling whose daughter is actually, you know, uh, viable for that scholarship and, and all that. So in our case, financial is a big deal, but then there are also these other non-financial areas that um, we would have to look into. I can definitely relate with um, my experience in Lebanon on the gift giving. Um, it's rude to say no. <laughs> and a lot of people don't really see that as a potential conflict of interest. Um, or even, um, as you, I think you had mentioned this before, um, a couple of slides before, um, how um, organizations are formed around, um, you know, the common interest of doing good. And sometimes um, the board consists of family members or friends. Um, and so a lot of people like these people don't assume that, you know, th um, there is a need for a conflict of interest because you're familiar with uh, these people. They're your friends and everything. Um, and so I've seen that a lot in Lebanon um, where it's a group of friends that start a nonprofit together or even um, the executive director being on the board. Um, which could potentially cause a conflict of interest. Um, yeah, so uh, definitely have seen that a lot in Lebanon. But thank you for sharing, Lynette and Martha. Um, I believe we've lost Catherine. Oh, she's back. <laughs> and um, we can move to the next slide. Uh, should a conflict of interest policy apply to everyone in the organization or only the board? or only executive staff or all staff, does it apply to volunteers? I believe we've touched uh, upon certain elements of this question, um, but it would be interesting to hear um, about um, all of your experience with this. Um, if a lot of conflict of interest policies that you've seen, um, do they apply to volunteers um, or is it mostly board focused and executive staff focused? Oh, you know, I would say I think that some kind of policy should apply to everyone who engages with the organization, including volunteers, how that what they need to do in response, I think, you know, would vary. So, for example, as I as I mentioned earlier, you know, there is a, an expectation in the U.S. that board members will annually disclose any conflicts in paper and it becomes a part of the annual meeting minutes. 
uh, you know, very large organizations, it's totally impractical for for every single staff member to annually disclose potential interests. I think it could, you know, in, in context is important, you know, as Catherine said earlier, right? So I think um, I, I think that, you know, one way to address this is maybe there's a conflict of interest policy that everyone should be aware of, um, but maybe certain people have to take more steps than others to demonstrate their compliance, depending on their level of authority or who they're engaging with or what program they're working on. Um, you know, also something like a code of ethics or a code of conduct is another place where you can talk about the importance of understanding that the way that conflicts can potentially um, impact our judgment. Um, so understanding those those facts and rules around things like bribery and corruption and conflict and and how they interact and and how one may be sort of unwittingly influenced um, in certain circumstances. I think everyone should have that basic awareness. But as I said, in terms of whether um, there needs to be documents filed demonstrating that disclosures were made. I think that 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 really depends on the size of the organization, um, the level of engagement, and the level of authority of the of the individuals. Thank you, Martha. Um, yeah, maybe I could just add to uh, what Martha has said, and uh, let me just emphasize that uh, it has to go beyond paper. Um, just do people understand, is it a practice? Um, and more so because, you know, be, be, you should also just be aware as, as an employee or as a person who engages an organization, how do you even in your conscience know that something in, in front of you can create a conflict? So, and that's why um, the, the question that should a conflict of interest apply to everyone in the organization, Yes, it should, but the more important is, is it's not about signing a paper, but also understanding what the policy is, because you can, when a new employee comes, you can automatically give them, here it is, sign, I need a job, I'll just sign, get, you know, and then move on. A board member will do the same, but it says, how, how often do you create that awareness of what the, what the policy says? Mm -hmm. How is it, how, how do you live it every day? Uh, I'll give an example. Uh, we we sometimes um, you may have a board member who, in their line of work, they are in a in a in a supply of a service. Uh, then, when you ask for a quotation for um, a service, they actually should, and they are part of signing for that quotation. They should actually know who is the client. Um, this client may be the organization where you're serving on the board. And then that board member should be able to say, no, we cannot bid for that, uh, for that um, quotation, uh, because they feel they will be conflicted when they have to, for example, follow up on that quotation. The question is, they are aware and are conscious that by engaging or even allowing for a quotation from the organization to go to your organization that they serve, is actually a conflict. It, it puts them in an awkward place. So I'm just saying that everyone should actually really be aware and apply that in the organization. But I think it's it's really more about just the practice, even your own conscience. Are you, mm -hmm. is, is that something that you resonate with? Yeah. Thank you, Catherine. I really like that point of um, how conflicts of interest should go beyond paper. I think that's a very um, important point to make. Um, and just to follow up on that, and I'll pose this to the larger group, um, is there any advice um, that you would give to organizations in order to implement this culture um, of conflicts of interest going beyond paper, whether it's trainings or workshops? Um, yeah, I would love to hear um, if any of you guys have uh, advice for organizations. Okay, maybe I, I could go first by saying that um, the, the, you will, of course, do the paperwork, which is probably a, a requirement, right? Yeah. Um, but then uh, in, your, in your annual um, learning forums, uh, um, it's good to have probably develop a, a, a time when, you, when the organization goes through certain policies and, and just reminding people about uh, very key and important um, practices that you need the organization or people in the organization to always reflect on. Um, then uh, also just ensuring that there are constant reminders on just the conflict of interest or to especially, it could be departmental uh, 
sessions. It could be um, even just uh, as you, for example, I've seen a practice where when you begin to review uh, like um, proposals for uh, consultancy, people actually should be able to first declare that they do not know or they will declare uh, and they're aware that they you're going to through this process and you you, you need to you need to declare um, the conflict of interest before you engage in that process so that people sort of continue to have that in their mind that it's important that I I declare uh, if I know anyone or in this process I, I need to know that there are certain things that I must be able to declare I think it's a practice then that helps to continue to remember what your role is um, in the policy. Thank you. You know, I'll add again, I also want to, I agree with everyone else uh, that Catherine's point about taking it beyond the paper and having people understand it is so critical. Um, and I particularly like Catherine's point about people sort of looking within to see that they understand it and how to apply it. And, you know, by way of example, at, at TechSoup, um, where I'm general counsel, one of the big things that we do is we try to connect compliance with the values of the organization so that it's not about um, we have to do this because this is what the law says, but it's about what are our values? What do we care about? What do we believe is ethical behavior? How do we want to behave as individuals and as an organization? And how does that connect with sort of compliance? And conflict of interest is, is a kind of compliance, right? And so it is sort of an examination of um, this isn't just about I, I need to do this because this is what is required under this grant or under a certain law. But because if you think about it, it's not fair necessarily for, you know, my um, child to get a job um, just because they're my child, right? Or I think using that sort of common sense kind of like, is this fair from sort of an, an ethical perspective is to have people think about it that way. It allows them to come to that judgment on their own without having to think, is this a conflict or not? I don't know. I should go review the policy and see. It becomes a little bit more natural and part of the values mm -hmm. and ethos of the organization. Um, and I think that's hard to do, but I I just want to reiterate uh, how, how important that is in, in implementing these policies. Thank you, Martha. Um, I guess we'll move to the next slide. What are the most common types of conflicts of interest that arise in CSOs? I think we have indirectly spoken into this, Tamara, in the mm -hmm. sense that you know they could be financial or non-financial. Um, they could be from a place of an individual benefiting um, at, the, at the expense of the organization. Um, yeah, and for me, I would still go back into gifts and the, the monetary part and also, you know, the power relations that come with development work. You know, you can imagine if when you do a humanitarian act like feeding um, the hungry, the power relation there is really high because they they would look at you as the person who fed them. Now, how do you protect that, that space so that, you know, you do not take advantage of them just because they have cramped that kind of power to you? So I'd say it's a very nuanced um, place. And it also calls for individual um, value system, moral awareness and all that. But that, that's how I would respond to this. Thank you, Lynette. Uh, Catherine, Martha, any points to add? Yeah, maybe I could just add that um, in, in in our setup, one conflict will also arise in um, where you use the organization's time, um, personal, uh, maybe equipment supplies um, to for your own interest. Um, Probably also, um, as Lynette has said, um, where a, a board member would then benefit from, say, a service, providing a service to an organization, um, which 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 then puts people in an awkward situation and they're not really able to say no to. Um, other situations would be, uh, you know, while one may think that when you do part time in you, in the, in the part-time or temporal employment in an, an organization where there's a, a potential for KCDF um, or an organization for that matter to 
have an appointment with so such that the, the, you probably have the same kind of interest, but then you're actually serving in in another organization that is maybe so to say a competitor. Um, just being aware about those kind of things, um, I think is important uh, for one to think about that are, are potential for conflict. Yes, maybe that's what I would say. Thank you, Catherine. Yeah, I would just add, I think the, the probably the most common ones for me are and are and are normally very harmless, if you will, but they're still very, very common is um, you know, uh when uh an executive officer is paid, um, so or a director is paid, um, which is which is fine, or you know, a um a staff member serves on the board, so serves both as a board member and a paid staff member, um, which is perfectly legal in most places. In some places it isn't, but um, it's it's less common. But um, in terms of directors are often not paid just for being directors, but it's not uncommon for, say, an executive director to also be on the board um, or be on a board committee. Um, I think the other situation I see often is very small new organizations that may maybe the founder gives wants to give a startup loan um, to make sure that the organization is able to hit the ground running. So, you know, sort of the question of how does that need to be documented? How do you ensure that... Um, that the founder, who is often also a director and often also the president, um, is is not necessarily gaining an advantage and you know an unfair advantage from the organization. So a lot of those very practical, how do I start up and fund an organization? How do I pay its its leaders when the organization is is very small and is made up of maybe two or three people at the start anyway, where necessarily everyone plays some important role. Um, and all and all of those, there are there are easy mechanisms to address them and document them um, because they are so common. Thank you, Martha. Uh, and our maybe next, Tamara, maybe Tamara, I could just add. Um, I mean, a, a one that I think we had mentioned earlier, and especially is where there's potential for, for being given a gift that is of high value um, or really unreasonable, and you accept it, and that um, I mean is is really potential for conflict, um, especially when it comes from. Uh, uh, an organization that is expecting to uh, maybe benefit from yeah. uh, a grant or a potential service from your organization. Um, I think that would also be a common pain in our sector. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so now we have just six frequently asked questions. Um, and I was thinking we can go through them as uh, round robin. So I'll ask the question and if anyone wants to chime in and answer it, um, feel free to. Um, so the first question, is it a conflict to pay board members? Okay, maybe I could say that um, as a nonprofit, uh, uh, board members serve on voluntary uh, basis. So um, our practice is that we provide, um, we could cover expenses, but, but no, no, no payment is made uh, in terms of their time. Um, the practice or the expectation is that they are joining a voluntary board and that they are willing to give of their time as part of their service. Thank you. And I'll add, this is this is something that's very universal. I agree with Catherine. Really, in I ha I haven't seen a country where it's common for board members to be paid more than a very nominal sum, if anything, as sort of a very small stipend. And even that is unusual. It is typically just reimbursement of expenses. Um, I will add, you know, for in in you under U.S. law, you are allowed to do so, but it is somewhat frowned upon. Um, and so I think it's relatively it is relatively uncommon. Thank you, Martha. Um, so is it a conflict to hire someone who is related to a staff person or a board member? We see this a lot in Lebanon. <laughs> you know, I one thing I'd like to say, because this is a, uh, the phrasing of these questions is, is it a conflict, right? And and I think one thing that's important to note is conflicts exist everywhere all the time. They're not all bad though, right? So absolutely, yes, it is a conflict, but is it a bad conflict? Not necessarily, not if it isn't, not if it is addressed appropriately, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, it is a potential conflict of interest, um, which means that it should be addressed and disclosed um, in some way for the people who are managing or hiring. Um, and then 
essentially, you know, that person cannot be treated any differently than any other person that's applying for the same role. Um, and so, you know, I think some organizations actually have a policy against it, but, you know, and a lot of times for very small organizations, that's the best way, or even large organizations, you know, you may have somebody who's, because they care about the mission, because they're related to someone in the organization, they may actually say, I'm happy to work, you know, half of the cost because I care about this and because of my existing mm -hmm. relationship, or I'm willing to be a volunteer for some time. And, and so I think there's a recognition that sometimes if it actually benefits the organization more than the individual, then that's not something that should necessarily be ignored, but, but it, um, but as long as that person is not receiving any kind of preferential treatment in any way compared to any other person who's looking at the same role. But very curious to hear sort of Lynette and Catherine's ex responses to this as well. I think I would say that, uh, Martha, um, that it's it's quite similar to that. But the only thing, I think sometimes you may want to um, even discourage discourage it uh, by just being very clear that, um, I mean, people say it, it's, it can disadvantage others, but the moment that you allow it, it, it can get out of hand. So I, I think it comes from organization to organization and um, the, really the, the thing is probably it should be discouraged as much as possible, but disclosure is important. Yeah, disclosure is important and you should, you cannot sit uh, through any process that mm. then that person uh, will go through, um, yeah, in, in any way. But remember, again, there's, there's influence, and influence can be even in the mindset, uh, where people then fail to be objective. And that's why I think you probably just really want to be very clear, and everybody needs to know that, um, first of all, disclosure. Um, then that's, once, you've, once you've, you've jumped over that, then the next thing is, um, how then do you treat that person? Um, yeah, just like Martha said, there's no special treatment, but it's it can get really sticky, I think. Yeah. And also a point to add um, for this specific case, it's very important to be transparent with the hiring process of that specific individual, um, just to you know, um, for it not to snowball into. Um, a bigger issue. Um, as uh, Catherine mentioned, it, it is quite tricky. Um, the other thing that I'll add or that Catherine made me think of also is the fact that it could be perfectly fair. It could even be in the advantage of the organization, but the optics could look bad. So, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. you know, which I, which I think is a good point that I, you know, it, uh, it, it could be somebody who's working at a fraction of the price, um, but not everybody knows that, right? And so within the organization, with outside of the organization, if all of a sudden they see that there are a bunch of family members on hire, it's not going to look good. And that's something you sort of have to battle. And I think the the appearance of a conflict can sometimes be as powerful as an actual conflict. And so knowing the optics of a situation, I think as Catherine said, that's just a reason in and of itself to maybe not encourage it <laughs> because it's not going to look good. And and I can give you an example of, I've you know served at organizations where people just happen to have the same last name and you know, third parties who have grievances against the organization will say, this organization is nepotistic. And it's like, actually not related. They just happen to have the same last name, right? So even in that situation, you can see how it can sort of hurt an organization, even though there, there truly is no conflict. Mm, yeah. Um, so let's move to the next question. Is it a conflict to serve on the board of more than one CSO? <laughs> Interesting, I have a quick one for that. Um, the thing is, I think that if the CSO is not, I, I think we must admit that in our sector that they, we do have competition, right? Um, in that there are things that two organizations can actually be doing similar work and you, you actually kind of like fundraise from the same sources and you have information that would create a, a, an awkward situation and you use that information from another organization to your advantage. I think it's important that someone should really not accept. Um, and, and I mean, just be aware that that would cre create conflict. And even as you are engaging a board member, um, are, are they disclosed um, everywhere they serve as a board member? and. And, and just being bold enough to, to not accept that person because the thing is we tend to get desperate to recruit board members, but we have all the information and sufficient enough to make us know that 
somebody coming in could create a conflict. And again, it's it's really difficult to remove someone from the board once they're in. So I think it's just to avoid that awkward situation that, that yeah, not just getting them on. Thank you, Catherine. I just wanted to add to what Catherine was saying, and it's even harder if this board member brings in resources to the non-profits. I feel like that conflict of interest when it comes to resources, yeah, it, 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 yeah. So I, in Kenya, legally, I don't know whether the duty of loyalty is captured, like where you could be sued for, you know, but I would... I would say it's a conflict of interest to be more than one year. So if your duty of loyalty is compromised for, for one organization over the other. Yeah. Thank you, Lynette. Um, we can move to the next question. So do conflicts of interest vary between types of organization or by region? Yeah, maybe, yeah. Yeah, uh, maybe quick maybe a quick one from me I would say that uh conflict of interest is contextual I think and may vary from region to region um like Martha said in the US it's a law and um, there are sort of strict um guideline um in another region it may just be a uh, good practice um and so there are those who will take it on and not take it on or yes yeah, so maybe maybe I think it's it's really contextual, but it's mm -hmm. it's becoming more of a, a best practice, and um, even our expectation from from uh, as as part of due diligence. Um, yeah, so I think that's what I would say. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, Martha, I'm curious. In the U.S., does it? Does it vary by type of organization or is it just like all types of organization and companies? Yeah, I would say it varies um, in the sense that it, that, it yeah, again, I'm going to agree with Catherine context, right? I, th I think that when you look at the types of organizations, two different organizations. So a great example is, again, someone serving on multiple boards. It's one thing to serve on the boards of, you know, two housing rights organizations that are both trying to get funding from the federal government, right? They're, you're potentially getting confidential information. They're related organizations. They're both seeking the same kind of grants versus serving on two boards where one is sort of animal rights advocates and 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 the other is, you know, um, a housing rights organization. I think that, that that doesn't present the same kind of conflict because the entities are different. I also think... Um, you know, organizations may, an organization that is engaged in a lot of advocacy work may take much more seriously concerns around conflicts that represent political interests, um, because that could, that could harm kind of their overall vision or could, could make them vulnerable, right? So I think there are a million different variations based on the type of the organization, the funding it seeks, the activities it's engaged in. And then as Catherine noted, the, the regional differences in that even within the United States, each state is governed by a different state nonprofit code, right? And so so um, they're largely very similar, but there are differences in between them that 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 vary based on where an organization is incorporated. Um, and so, and obviously that 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 similar dynamic plays out between different countries um, globally, and and how they uh, look at conflicts of interest um, within their own laws, as well as within just their best practices and within the sector and how the sector tends to act within a certain region. Thank you, Martha. Um... I think let's move to the next question as we've gone slightly a bit over time. But, um, so are there local or international laws or regulations that describe or govern conflicts of interest? I guess I'll just reiterate what I said earlier. There are, you know, there are certain laws. I think um, there is a big there, it's always important to look at the law and what is best practices, because as I said, they're they're not always the same. I, I tend to find best practices considers conflicts to be much broader. Um, but in terms of, you know, certainly within the United States, as I said, each state has its own laws, and then there's there's a federal law that applies. Um, there are some international provisions that guide um, within sort of anti-bribery and anti-money laundering laws that look at the impact of conflicts of interest to the extent that they might 
lead to potential bribery or um, money laundering, which apply generally to, you know, UN regulations, or large swaths of countries um, within the world. So they're quite global. Um, beyond that, um, again, I, I think it would be interesting to hear from Catherine and, 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 and Lynette in particular, since Catherine, you made the comment about there being not as many laws, particularly about conflicts of interest, but something that's really a trend, uh, um, a growing trend within the sector itself. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think what I could say um, is that um, conflict of interest um, comes in different forms. I'll give you an example, and maybe Lynette can help me here, is that, for example, in Kenya, uh, one of the things that civil servants are required to do is declare their wealth, right? So there's a wealth declaration form, you fill, and then the thing is, Part of that is part of the process where you can be able to see where people, whether people have been engaged in issues of conflict of interest, where probably they benefited from, say, a certain situation. Um, and, and with that, then it sort of helps people to know that there are certain things I can do and cannot do. But then um, in, in, I'm, I'm not really aware um, about uh, a, a regulation in Kenya that specifically talks about conflict of interest. Um, and that's why it's for us, it's more, more of a, a good practice. Um, and a lot of times um, it, it comes from, uh, because many organizations and people who want to um, uh, appear to, to be doing proper relationship and engagement, wants to see you having certain certain regulations and law and rules that govern the operation. So, and that's why if you're getting funding from, from and even up some private sector organization, they want to see what are your practices that ensure that you, you, you are transparent in how you operate, that there's conflict of interest policies and certain policies in place. And because it's, it's really about good practice, that is really governing um, most most organizations um, in, in the civil society organizations in, in our in our in our space, and and because you of the need for compliance, um, so you could have a policy uh, on paper, but is it a practice? Uh, and, and and I think that's what I would say. Uh, and, and because of that, many organizations continue to try and, and enhance your governance by ensuring that these documents are in place, beginning to have a practice by, by uh, educating or training staff on conflict, training the board on conflict, ensuring that these are things, practices uh, that, that then govern how you operate and how you operationalize your, your, the policies that you have. Um, I think that's what I would say, maybe Lynette. Um, do you have anything to add? Thanks, Catherine. I, I totally am in alignment with what you're saying. And also, so like I'll give an example of Kenya and even Uganda. You find that um, there are different types of um, legal identities for organizations. So there's a non-governmental organization, which has a totally different government body that legislates for them. It's called the NGO board. Yeah. And then there is another identity that is foundations um, and trusts. And then there is also a, a famous one is where companies are registered as uh, limited by guarantee, but they are exclusively non-profit. So you find even within one country, non-profits then are operating under very different legal identity. And so in terms of international law, what I have seen as a practice for many funders is when they fund you, their grant agreement binds you to be under the law of their country. So if you get um, a fund from the American Foundation, you will notice that in their grant agreement, they give a clause that should there be you know, an anomaly or a legal that this will be treated under the American law or under whichever law. So I think that's how then the funding community has decided to, to deal with the different 
uh, legal conditions in the different countries there are. Um, yes. So like now that the company is limited by guarantee, which are for non-profits, you'll find a lot of families then tend to form these non-profits. Um, and sometimes they will just flaunt, you know, they'll just ignore those rules until they are required to say by a funder. So it's a complex, there's no easy answer to this. It's a bit complex and messy in the way the laws are so different, but the funders then would tend to use the law of their country. Yeah. Thank you, Luna. Um, and so this is the final question. Um, and so what happens if we discover a conflict of interest after a transaction or other event has already occurred? Hmm. I, you know, I was glad that Catherine brought this up earlier, just when she talked about the procedure to follow that needs to be an important part of a conflict of interest policy, which is which is absolutely true. Like what I think this is critical so that you're not having to figure out what to do once the conflict has already arisen, then there's there's already sort of a lack of objectivity in putting together that process. The process should already be in place. Um, so every conflict of policy should really have detail like how does this work? At what point does it need to be di disclosed? Um, by whom? And then, you know, two different situations. It's it's um, if it was disclosed, um, then how is it addressed by the board or by a committee or who is the one that actually reviews those? So it's more than just somebody filing a paper and then no one looking at it. Right. Um, and then there's another situation is what happens if a conflict is discovered that wasn't disclosed and there has to be some, you know, uh, sort of um, investigation, to, which is a strong word. I think in, in many cases, it's because someone maybe didn't realize that it needed to be disclosed. Right. But it still requires um, looking into kind of the facts of um, did this pose a problem? What do we need to do to make to sort of make it right? And and I think m make it right maybe just reviewing it after the fact and noting noting that you know no no harm was had um, or no injustice was was carried out as a result. Or it may be actually taking steps to undo something that had already happened. Um, you know, one thing I'll note um, that is a, a key part of the U.S. laws and state laws around conflict of interest that apply to nonprofit organizations is they all require that they have these de decisions have to be made prior to a transaction occurring. So there are certain steps that can be taken once it's already happened because it, that's inevitable. Um, but there's really there's a lot of emphasis placed on um, discussing and addressing them in written format um, before you enter into a transaction in which a conflict um, is, is at play. So to the extent that that's possible, it's something that should always be clearly documented in advance that so the board has to approve it in advance, for example. Um, but in reality, this will, you know, not is not always the case and a policy should really be clear in, um, in sort of how to, what steps to take and, and also how to potentially um, communicate externally with the decisions that were made so that an organization keeps its reputation intact, frankly. Maybe it did make a mistake and that's okay. So own up to it and try to make it right. Don't try to cover it up as with all things. Um, that's never going to do anyone any good. Um, so yeah, I think having a process in, defined in advance um, that you can rely on to pursue it objectively and then just sort of owning up to the mistake and taking all the steps you can to um, to rectify. Thank you, Martha. Yeah, um, just to add to that is that um, I think if it's very clear um, the procedure for disclosure uh, are clear and well communicated and I mean, if people do understand, then really then failure to disclose a potential conflict of interest then amounts to misconduct. I mean, uh, the thing is, I think the issue here is how do you remain consistent so that people don't feel that it applies to others but not to uh, to the others. And therefore, it, it's it's what, what are those procedures then that you need to put in place to ensure that um, uh, people are, are reminded to declare because then it, it really if to be consistent then if 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 it has happened then then the, the, this really amounts to, to misconduct and so then the, what is the next course of action your policy needs to be very clear about what is the next course of action if you never de declared um and 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 because of that uh, uh i'll give an example um and I think I said this earlier, 
and it, it's just about practice. Can we put in place tools that help us when you are going through a process? People are able to uh, declare that I have no conflict of interest on this matter. Because then you somebody is actually reminded at that point in time, this is what the policies say. Then you can then argue at that point is, am I getting into a situation which will be has potential for conflict of interest? And so it's it, it it then you then avoid that, but how then do you remain consistent if then you're kind of weighing whether is it a conflict, do you do that? So I think it's it 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 would then really create a, a bad situation in an organization. So I think um the unfortunate thing is that you need to be, to take a hard stand on on a situation, but again, it it's contextual. But the worst thing is when you're not consistent, then people don't take it seriously. Thank yeah. you, Catherine. Lynette, anything to add? I think this really speaks to even the way the step framework is designed. Because um, if you look at the questions in the step framework, there's a question around, do you have a policy um, or a process? And I think this is an invitation for us as organizations, us in the due diligence side of things, that having a policy is just the beginning of the journey. How, how do you move now from a policy to practice, you know? And in between there, if there are no operational tools that Kathy is talking about, that is consistency, um, then you will find that there is um that it's not being applied um or adhered to as it should. On our end that step, we are also working to provide as as many templates as possible for nonprofits, in the sense that if you have a policy, what kind of tools would you have? How do they look? And you can give a sample of that so that the, an organization can look at it and say, you know what, we can adopt this for ourselves and all that. So from policy, between policy and practice, we need operational tools, and that's worth investing for every nonprofit. Yeah. Thank you, Luna. Um, and with that, um, I'd like to thank you for attending this call. Um, all of your insight was uh, incredibly helpful, um, and I'm sure that um, our STEP community on the uh, resource portal will find this um, very helpful.